Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Ask the Experts for Digital Breakout 129. This is a continuation of the session for Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare. We hope you enjoyed the session earlier this evening and will continue to enjoy the conversation tonight. My name is Sharon. I'll be going over some quick housekeeping items with you before we turn it over to our speakers. Quick notes on how to engage with our experts. Please use the chat to ask your questions. The questions will appear to all of our attendees once they go through our moderation process. Once you see them in the chat, please use the thumbs up sign to vote for your favorite questions. Our experts will answer questions as quickly as they can. They'll answer verbally and over chat. And we will also provide you with resource links throughout the session so that you have opportunity to learn more. This session is being recorded, so you'll have the opportunity to go back and review the information that is provided. We ask that you kindly not spam the chat and please be considerate and not post inappropriate comments. Also, please take a moment to review the Microsoft Code of Conduct. It is in the chat and on your screen. Please take note of that bottom paragraph, photography or video of the session is not permitted. As I said, we will be recording the session for you. And with that, I turn it over to our experts to introduce themselves. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Um, Doug, do you want to go ahead? Sure, I'll start. We're, uh, we have some names on the screen, but I think we're going to go a little out of order. So I'm Doug Seven. I'm the Senior Director in Microsoft Health Next, which is part of research and incubation at Microsoft. And my team is responsible for building uh, parts of the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare, particularly the Azure uh, API for Fire and some of the tools that connect us to the Power Platform. And I'll pass it to Linda. Hi, everyone. My name is Linda Simovich, not Linda Sim, as it says on the screen. <laughs> I am working on the business application solutions as part of the Cloud for Healthcare. So all of the uh, great use cases around care management and patient engagement, and happy to answer any questions. Oh, should I pass it off? Um, how about passing off to Jason? All right, thank you, Linda. Uh, my name is Jason Ferrick. I am a principal solution architect on our Microsoft Cloud for Health uh, application. I work closely with Linda and other team members uh, on the team, on our engineering team, uh, on building the products that are uh, that are being brought to market for the Microsoft Cloud for Health. So looking forward to the questions that you guys have for us today, and I am going to pass it off to David. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm David Mould. I'm an industry architect working for MCS in the healthcare portfolio, uh, and my role is shaping solutions for customers and partners and helping deliver that at scale. Thanks for engaging today. Looking forward to answering your questions. Uh, hi, hi everybody. This is I'm Karen, and I'm the regional business lead for um, the industry vertical of healthcare at Microsoft basically work very closely with clients and with partners to onboard them onto the healthcare cloud. Um, so happy to be speaking with you today. Look forward to your question. So um, I can reply to Jesse um, directly because we have we had a uh, public preview that had an open um, form where you could elect to be in that public preview. And at this time, I don't know that we're going to be opening it up in the last few weeks before our release, um, but I definitely can find out more information for you, Jesse. So I will just uh, respond in chat and make sure that we get your information. Thanks, Linda. And I, I don't know if Jesse is from Asia, but um, we in Asia, we do have a lot of partners coming in in tier two and tier three. Um, so it would be good to check if they're already kind of scheduled. Hey everybody, this is Doug again. Since we have a, a little bit of a lull in questions as they start to come in, uh, I'll share with you uh, some of the some of the things that came up earlier today during the session. Uh, there was a particular question that came up that I found interesting, and I think as uh, as people watch the session and learned more about what the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare is, 
Um, the answer probably revealed itself, but uh, but I'll share it here, which was there's a question as to whether or not the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare is intended to be um, an electronic health record or elect electronic medical record, EMR, EHR, um, or if it's intended to replace an EMR or EHR. And the answer is no, there is no intent here for us to replace the EMR, EHR. Um, the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare is really designed as a set of tools and applications that augment um, the, the systems and sources of truth you have for clinical uh, healthcare data. So the EHRs, the PAC systems, um, the IoT devices collecting biomedical. Um, the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare is a set of capabilities that extend what you're able to do with that data in terms of um, things like patient care and coordination of care and, and some of these other scenarios and even extend into the ability to bring data into um, a hyperscale cloud environment so you can start to do things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, so I just wanted to, I thought since we had a little in questions, it'd be good to kind of uh, address that one early on. But I think as you watch the session, if you if you didn't get a chance to watch and go back and watch it, you'll see that sort of reveal itself as we explain what the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare is. Yeah, and Doug, if I can just add to that as well, um, what I mean, in the last, I've been in healthcare for 15 years, and what we do see as a very interesting trend is that earlier um, the EHR was like the EMR, like the point of truth. But now we do see um, a lot of other types, third party data. We see a lot of wearable data. We see a lot of smart device data coming in. So in a way, um, the EMR is probably not the whole truth anymore. And I think this is where, like you rightly said, the healthcare cloud comes in play because we are able to kind of use the healthcare cloud with its tools uh, and other models that we have to integrate all this data. And that, especially post COVID, has created a lot of interest uh, because people want to know how they can integrate different forms of data to make sense and draw insights from that. And Doug, I see another question here on um, regionalization. So what we're doing around things like fire and interoperability and standardization, will that be the same across all regions or will there be, or how are we addressing individual regional specific health standards? Yeah, I was just looking at that question from Naresh. Uh, is the health cloud standard for all regions or specific to each country as each country follows different health standards? And the way to think about this is what we've done with the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare is um, put together a set of capabilities to address key use cases. So um, I mentioned earlier patient care or patient engagement or, or some of these other things. Um, there's a bunch of capability that we put into the, into the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare to address a, a wide variety of scenarios. Now at a regional level, the application of those scenarios is subject to um, different regulation. So um, I'll go back to, I'll sort of speak from my own domain, uh, working with the uh, Azure API for Fire, which is part of the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare, and it's part of the connection of all these things that work together. Um, that, that capability is available in, um, I think we're in 12 regions around the world and going out to more regions uh, continuously. And in each region that we bring our healthcare capabilities into, we have to evaluate if there are specific um, compliance rules that we have to understand and ensure that we're following in those regions and how we're working with that data and what we're doing with it. Um, this is critical to us. This is of, of immense importance to us that we ensure that um, you know protected health information be treated as some of the most sensitive and, and valuable data there is in terms of, of privacy and security. And so as we go into each of these regions, it's important we understand what the rules are for that region. Um, so there's uh, nothing in particular about some of these things we're building that would prohibit it from being in one region or another, but we do have to ensure that the underlying services and underlying capabilities have been, um, all, all the due diligence is done to make them appropriate for the regions they're in. Uh, so we could probably address specific questions about specific regions by looking at the, the collection of tools we have and, and where they are with these regions. Um, I will say that, you know, we start with um, the regulations for protected health information in the United States of America uh, as dictated by the HIPAA privacy rules. 
Um, and that's pretty pretty constrained. It's pretty tight in terms of the controls we have to have in place and the things we have to do to ensure we're taking care of data correctly. And then as we go into other regions, in many cases, we have rules around where the data resides. Does it stay in the region or does it not stay in the region? And, and then there may be other additional compliance uh, that we have to adhere to. One of the things we're, we're trying to ensure that we can do is say, you know, across this collection of tools that we have uh, and, and solutions that we're providing, that we've met all of those compliance requirements. So we'll be completely transparent about what compliance requirements we've achieved for what region, and so that will be easy for you to find and easy for you to understand, so you can uh, identify whether or not the solution is correct for your region. Actually, Doug, there was another question here I was just picking up on. Um, mm. And as you started talking about DICOM, I was I was looking at it and thinking about imaging. And there's a question here that says, what is our view? Or how do we envisage HoloLens being used in health? And I know we've done some work in some yep. of those areas. And I'm just thinking about the extension from the healthcare cloud and what we can do around DICOM and centralizing imaging and from PACS and other, other imaging standards into the healthcare cloud. Maybe that's a great foundation into then how we would use things like mixed reality to further empower care teams. Have you got any more viewpoints on that? Yeah, I'll probably uh, add a bit over here. Um, so uh, David, when it comes to um, HoloLens, I think we've uh, kind of done a lot of path breaking work. Of course, I think the person mentioned dental and um, rehab as well, but we've also done based on the healthcare cloud, we've been able to kind of bring in images uh, and integrate that with some of the EMR solutions we have. So even in this part of the region, in terms of pre-surgery planning, surgery planning, we've gotten into areas like um, brain tumor removal, we've gone into liver um, cancer and so on. Areas where I understand from the doctors that they've spent 10 years trying to kind of, you know, render these images and bring them into the hospital. Um, and I think with the healthcare cloud and the HoloLens 2, that has become a reality. So that is definitely one of the use cases uh, which is very prominent in this part of the world in HoloLens. I have another use case for that too, Karen. Um, yeah. So from a, um, in our Dynamics 365 business, we have a product called D365 Guides, which yeah. is currently being used for training. So in um, any kind of very highly skilled worker situation where you have machinery or a step-by-step -step process that has to be trained. We have mm. customers using guides today to guide them through that process so that when someone gets a new skill and they have to learn that quickly and correctly, precisely, um, we've been seeing a lot of success stories in guides and I can see that eventually being used in a healthcare scenario. Yeah, and, and there's actually I think, a quick uh, plug for a session here. There is another session, IGL 157 on reimagining um, healthcare education using Dynamics 365 guides as well. So a quick plug for that session, which is running at the same time. I love that you know the session ID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there is a part of the question was in relation to, you know, using tools like the HoloLens along with sort of more traditional medical imaging like DICOM data, MRIs, ultrasounds, things like that. There's been some examples of how we can use HoloLens with um, sort of more um, animated type of uh, imaging data that could be derived from some of these things. But there's certainly some opportunity to look at how we could use more traditional uh, data sources in a more um, interesting use case in, in some of these mixed reality scenarios. We've actually done a few different hackathons over the last couple of years where we've had uh, some of the participants in the hackathons build HoloLens applications using uh, the Fire API for clinical data to bring clinical data into a HoloLens environment to make that data more um, attainable in its context. As uh, and, and We haven't done anything uh, to date, my team hasn't done anything to date with uh, DICOM data in HoloLens, only because we were still building the DICOM server. Uh, but now that we have it, we're, we're looking forward to doing it. We have some people on the team who actually have a, a background in HoloLens, so I'm sure we'll have some, uh, at least POCs and examples of what we can do with it fairly soon. And I can, I can get the information um, back through probably some of the Ignite session content, but there has been done some work done here in Asia with Toshiba 
on actually taking some of the some of the information off the PAC server and allowing that to be presented through HoloLens, HoloLens version one. Um, so it would be interesting to see how we can both update that to HoloLens version two, and then what we could also learn from that as, as a bigger pattern uh, into the Dicon server. So more, more to come on that, I think. And also there was a couple of questions, one from Jesse and one from Anonymous on um, the recent announcement around Nuance and DAX integration into Teams and a couple of questions on how to get access to that. Is it a standard offering? Who can talk a little bit more about DAX and Nuance? Nobody. Mm. OK, uh, we'll come back to you. We'll come Jesse specifically. Uh, we'll come back to you on that one. Um, and then a question here from Brent. Internally on um, one commercial partner and, and what can be done more widely about amplifying the Microsoft Cloud for healthcare across the different sub verticals, provider, payer and life sciences. Yeah, and I, I think can probably take one part of that. Um, so when it comes to um, the OCP side, uh, I think those um, partners who have already been scheduled for onboarding in the preview stage as tier one, two and three, there are regular sessions that you can plug in. Having said that, um, I think those sessions are every week, but having said that, you can also kind of request for demos or presentations. We are already doing that with a couple of our um, ISVs and SI. And in terms of the field, uh, there are a set, the team is, uh, the worldwide team is putting together a set of um, fields, communications and training material that you will soon see. Uh, I think come GA, you will have access to all that material. And so that will make the field ready as well. You're going to be conducting sessions, seminars, uh, as well as uh, presentations that you can jump into. In, re in regard to the question about uh, nuance and DAX, um, I'm not sure I, I fully understand the context of the question, but I can share that uh, we announced quite a while ago our partnership with nuance and part of that partnership was to bring our speech and language capabilities uh, to, into partnership with nuance, who was already a leader in this space and kind of do a, a little bit of a better together capability. Uh, we nuance uh, has their DAX offering uh, that was announced a while ago and what uh, was recently announced was the DAX integration into Teams for uh, some of these coordinated care scenarios and things like that. That is currently, my understanding is, I believe still in private preview, but will be part of the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare uh, release wave. So we have it's a really good example of, of how any work we're doing in any of the other commercial areas like Microsoft 365, Dynamics 365, um, and has help has those solutions mature the roadmap into the healthcare cloud. So because the nuance integration into Teams is something that's in private preview and will become GA, that means that inevitably at some point it will be available as a standard workload inside the healthcare cloud underneath underneath the Microsoft 365 Teams workloads that sit inside the healthcare cloud. We have another very interesting question from Richard, um, and he says that he's not heard uh, about the MS Cloud for Healthcare, and they're already working a lot with Microsoft. They're a large healthcare company, nearly 200 hospitals, thousands of care sites, and so on. So they, the question is, does the program really offer anything that a company at our scale doesn't already have with such significant internal investments? Um, Richard, the answer is uh, yes. And the reason is because the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare actually has very interesting patient and clinical models. Uh, and I think if I'm not wrong, we currently have over 400 which are very healthcare specific and we are adding uh, more capabilities uh, as the weeks go by. And so I think it would be interesting for you to see how you can land some of these scenarios. At the moment we have about, I think, 13 scenarios around care coordination and others as well. So it would be good to have a discussion as to what are some of the things that you can leverage on, uh, given the fact that you know they all come to life, of course, with the Microsoft Dynamics 365 Teams, uh, Azure, and of course our partner solutions as well. So it would definitely be interesting to have a discussion on how you can leverage 
and what are some of the things that you know you can plug and play and as doug mentioned earlier you have the fire you have the fire for iomt and so on um so these are things that are newly being added and i think they are cutting edge because as post covid we do see a lot of requests coming in for remote monitoring and things like that so it would be good to have a discussion can I can I add to that too, Karen? Um, yes, which is Linda. A great response. Um, also, I think one of the really great innovations here is that we're able to take all of the healthcare data into a common data model, as Karen was talking about. And when we drop that into our common data service, this opens up a ton of use cases that typically take a long time to implement from like a, a development perspective. So with Power Apps and the Power Platform, you're able to now automate off of that data. You can trigger and, and automate and link into other legacy systems and build UI paths that take that through the flow of you know, inputting data. We also have um, this ability to just do drag and drop Canvas apps. We have model-driven apps with all the role-based access into it that a non-developer can make a internal app that you can deploy to all of your workers internally to the hospital. So there's a lot more that we're trying to showcase to tell more of that story, but there, this is something that we believe is unique and really valuable to any organization, especially at the size that, that your company works at. I think building on what Linda said there in response to Richard, I would look at this and I would say, one of the benefits might be uh, simplifying the overall architecture that goes on inside your organization. Um, maybe deduplicating some of the services and having an organization the size of Microsoft actually work on all that plumbing essentially for you and, and pre-packaging it into a, into a platform. That would then drive consistency um, because the, the patient, the clinician, the care team experience would be the same in every one of those sites that you're talking about, uh, which may not may or may not be the case. It's typically, particularly if we think about how some of these organizations grow through mergers and acquisitions, the experience isn't always the same. And so uh, maybe there's some, there's some things to think about in there in terms of operating efficiencies, but also cost efficiencies that might be uh, something to look at for the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare. Yeah, thanks, David. We have another very interesting question from Jesse and from an, an anonymous person. The question is that um, Teams is still a long way off from you know, being used as a telehealth platform. Uh, and so uh, how do we see this going forward? And Jesse adds on to say that um, you know, we were looking at having a patient 360 app for Teams. Um, so has that already been announced? And I think these two questions are quite related. Yeah. Anybody wants to take that on? I can take it on from one one direction, which is yeah. um, everything we, we everything we're attempting to do uh, inside all of these platform parts is really make the platform integratable and interoperable. And I look at some of the, the work that's been done to make Teams at least an access point or an endpoint for any of the work we're doing around EMR integration and fire. Um, and certainly one of the things I'm looking at from a delivery perspective is we're now working at scale with a partner uh, and or systems that actually is, is doing that. And they have actually gone much further with the, with the basic capabilities that we've delivered in teams. And they've then taken that out into multidisciplinary team meetings, care team coordination, virtual business, and they've extended it, the canvas way beyond uh, what we've been doing from an engineering perspective. Uh, and this this is as really a sign of the success of the platform direction we've taken, which is provide the ability and the capability, and then partners will come. Partners like on, on here with with us in this session will then build on that, and then how we can then help take that to scale through our enterprise relationships. Doug, do you have anything to add on that, or, or Linda? Yeah, thank you. You you covered it. Thank you, David. There is a question here from Teams about the patients apps for Teams and whether that's been turned into Patient 360. 
I don't have the context into what the patient's app for Teams was in the past, but I do know that is not the same as Patient 360. So Patient 360 is um, our ability to, to have a common data model in our, as I was saying earlier, in the common data service that's relevant for healthcare. And we have created um, a, a model-driven app that we're calling Patient 360 that displays all of the relevant healthcare information that surrounds that patient. The Patient 360 module can be um, propagated through other apps like a patient call center or through a patient engagement um, and, and the other apps that sit on top of CDS. If you did decide to build um, your own app or, or business process, you could use Patient 360 for that, but that is not the same as Teams. And if anyone else in the panel knows more about the Teams app, feel free to jump in. I'm not sure what that one was. Yeah, I can, if you don't mind my adding in, Linda, um, yeah. I'm not so sure about the Teams app, but I think through the healthcare cloud, um, some of the work that we're doing in this region, uh, and they call it as Patient 360, uh, which is where we are looking at, um, you know, kind of having a full continuum engagement with a patient. So basically we have clients where, you know, the patients either is a walk-in or it's through the call center or it's through their portal or through their web app. Um, you're able to kind of um, talk to them in a continuous fashion and then of course you you know kind of triage and then you have the telehealth part and then you're able to have a live visit and then a follow-up. So in many of our clients uh, patient 360 also has a different definition of being able to continuously engage with a patient uh, and even after they leave the hospital you still want to kind of you know reach out and see and do a follow-up and then send them reminders, connect them with, let's say, the pharmacies and so on. So those kind of scenarios we do um, land with the healthcare cloud, uh, but I'm not so sure about the Teams app, as you said, yeah. So this is in relation to um, back around HIMS, back around build. Um, we, we were talking about using lists, Microsoft lists, uh, and, and enabling that inside Teams for care team coordination. Mm. And so that is down there. If, if, if you were to go into Teams, you can actually um, add lists as a channel and you can deploy the template, which is the patient application. Just building back on what I said earlier, um, it, is, it is an example of how you can take things like a common data model, power apps, lists, some of the other elements, components in the platform and integrate those uh, through a canvas like theme. Yes. Have a look at it, uh, experiment with it, but you would probably find that doing something like uh, what Linda is saying with Patient 360 and actually bringing that Dynamics 365, that Power Apps Canvas, but that um, model driven app experience into Teams will probably be a better outcome for your what you're trying to achieve with a care team uh, around around managing patients would be my suggestion. Well, it's also worth noting that part of what we announced with Teams is that as part of the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare is the Teams integration with EHRs. Um, and I think we notably mentioned Epic as a way of connecting Teams to Epic and to bring that clinical data into the Teams environment. And the way we do that is through the um, FHIR standard. So data comes into Teams as FHIR data, which is a really designed around the interoperability of these systems. So EHR is connecting to Teams through FHIR, but we also have the ability to connect uh, any EHR that um, implements the FHIR standard uh, to the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare through the Azure API for FHIR. So that becomes your connection point for, for creating essentially a digital reflection of your EHR data in the cloud and then connecting it in through uh, the common data model and other things into these other, other tools and other experiences to work with. Um, so that's a huge part of what we're doing here is creating this interoperability, not only from uh, you know an EHR to Teams or an EHR to a particular product, but once you get the data into this portfolio of, of capability, it becomes portable between these things, uh, which is which is pretty remarkable. There was a question from Jesse as to whether or not we have an exact list of EHRs that we connect with. Um, there's two parts to the, to that answer. Uh, the one part is we will certainly when we GA uh, at the end of October have a list of EHRs that are compatible. Um, there's two compatibility points. One is uh, what does Teams, 
work with directly. So what uh, what EHRs can teams directly integrate with to bring that data into the teams environment. Uh, but then the other is how can you then connect through Azure and the Azure API for Fire to any EHR uh, where there's uh, likely a little bit more orchestration to be done there in terms of using something like Azure Data Factory to um, to move the data around, but decide how frequently you want to move that data around. So rather than penetrating the EHR on every request, you're creating, like I said, that sort of digital reflection of your data in the cloud and starting to bring that together with other data, your IoT data, your genomics data, your social determinant data, and then bring that data into these other environments. I kind of like this question from Brent. He says, uh, if a customer is trying to decide between Microsoft and other cloud providers out there, why would they choose Microsoft? Um, and if they're already on another cloud, why would they switch to Microsoft? Are you just asking the question, you're not answering it? <laughs> <laughs> well, so here's what I'll share uh, from my perspective. And, and you know, we're obviously we're, we're a bit biased because we're all the Microsoft people, but um, there's a tremendous amount of energy across the company being put into supporting healthcare and health and life sciences scenarios. The Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare um, represents the sort of cross company effort working across divisions to unify some of these products and scenarios in support of healthcare uh, and health related um, use cases. And so, you know, from my perspective, there's a, there's a few things that I would look at as a customer. One is, does it feel like the investment from the company is there? And I would check that box and say, yes, this, this represents a pretty significant investment. And if you roll back and look at what we've been doing over the last number of years, you can see this investment growing and growing and growing as we've done things in Teams and we've done things in Dynamics and we've done things in Azure. And now to really unify those things on behalf of the customer to make this a, a much better uh, sort of experience across all those things is one thing. The other thing to look at is just overall, um, you know, trust with the, cl the cloud that you're with, uh, right? Because this is some of the most sensitive data in the world. This is protected health information. So, um, you know, making sure that all the compliance that is necessary is there is one thing, but also just the trust and relationship you you forge and build with the company uh, that is providing that that uh, promise to you. I guess is the way I would say it. Um, you know, we can certainly get into you know, shootouts between different companies of do you have this capability, do you have that capability, and uh, different companies will rise to the top in different use cases and different scenarios. I think you have to look at that total picture. You have to look at the relationship with the company, trust with the company, the investment the company is making. Um, and I personally feel like Microsoft really checks all those boxes quite well. So I, I would encourage you to come try our stuff. And actually just picking up on a question that we haven't touched yet. There was a very early on in, in the call around what specific examples have we done in, with the Canadian health system? Um, um, and if I think about the differences between you know, the US and, and Canada. Canada is a bit more like the UK or Australia, so more centrally funded. Um, Doug, with the work that was done very early on around fire interoperability, have we done much work in Canada and to address some of the different modality of how the health system runs there versus what we've done in the, in the US? So I don't have specific examples with Canadian companies that I can share. In other words, I don't have any cited examples that I can I can quote from. What I can share is um, that we've done work across a, a number of different countries where we are dealing with different um, payer and provider type scenarios, going from multi-payer to single payer, from from uh, sort of all these different scenarios that you would deal with. Um, and that work, by the way, has spanned North America, the US, uh, Canada, Mexico. We've, we've done work in Europe, uh, in the UK, France, Germany. We've done work in Australia. We've done work in New Zealand. And so, uh, and we've done work in, in parts of uh, Southeast Asia as well. And we've rolled out our service there based on customer demand. So we're really looking across these. And, and while I uh, unfortunately can't cite a specific example for you here today, we're going to put together some of the evidence of some of these customers and what they're doing uh, and how they're working. Uh, that being said, 
kind of this kind of relates to that question earlier about sort of regional use that these tools are designed to be adaptable to different regional use cases and different uh, scenarios. So uh, what might be appropriate for um, a payer based system in the United States might be different for a payer based system in Canada or in, uh, in Europe. Um, I will point out that in this and this was mentioned early earlier in the session that Tom McGinnis did earlier. This first wave of the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare is really heavily targeted towards the provider and what the provider use cases are. We do intend to have use cases around payer um, and around med tech and other things as we as we evolve the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare. But don't be surprised when the initial offering is very provider centric. And I think it actually it was a question in, in that session earlier on um, on Tom's first session on, on DB126 that was where is the healthcare cloud targeted at? Is it provider or is it hospital systems? Um, and I think how you've answered it, you know, I was I would say the same thing, which is depending on the specifics of your market, whether you're single payer, institutional payer, centrally funded, co -payer, what all the variations of payer provider dynamics, um, the ability to take the use cases that will come inside the healthcare cloud for, uh, at launch at GA, you would be able to combine those use cases and then configure and then customize. So what we've tried to do with the platform is make it as easy as possible to take use cases that are predefined, pre-built, pre-integrated um, and make it as easy as possible for healthcare systems to then configure those to your needs and then and then customize as needed. And I think there's enough range within there, enough breadth within there that will allow a Canadian system, an Australian system, a US system, someone like a Kaiser Permanente, all of these people, the variants of healthcare delivery to make the healthcare cloud fit their purposes around what we're trying to do, which is consistency, interoperability, and to drive information into the hands of care providers where they need it through whatever device that looks like. Thank you all so very much for your expertise and your answers. Unfortunately, we are over on our session and this channel is needed for another session. We would love to continue the conversation. We wish we could keep going. Uh, if there is a resource where we could continue, a community or a website that you would like to put in the chat, please do so now. But unfortunately, it is time for us to continue and wrap up. So thank you, everyone. We appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. To all of our experts, thank you. Thanks so much. All a Thank wonderful you. ignite. Take, Take care. care. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you for your time. Thank Bye -bye. you.